Well, my task this evening is to set the broader context for marriage in the United States today. Uh, the National Pastoral Initiative on Marriage, undertaken by the U.S. bishops, and how we come to be speaking here this evening at Boston College about the spirituality of marriage. Not too large a task. <laughs> There's no question that the experience of marriage and how we think about it has changed over time. So here's a brief snapshot of marriage in the United States today. People are getting married later in life. The median age for men is now over 27. For women, it's over 25. And it's increasing all the time. Nearly half of all marriages are not first marriages for one or both partners. The marriage rate continues to decline and has dropped over 50% in 50 years. The marriage rate for African Americans is considerably lower than for any other U.S. population, while Hispanics are considerably higher. The percentage of never married people ages 25 to 35 increased by over 20% in the last 30 years, which suggests more lifelong singlehood in adults marriage is no longer seen as a natural progression or stage in life for many people. 50 to, around 50% 50 of Catholic marriages are between a Catholic and a non-Catholic. And whether those Catholics are practicing Catholics is another story. Within the first few years of marriage, nearly half of all interchurch or interfaith couples become same church because one spouse or both change their religious affiliation. The rate of divorce is still around 50%, although it's leveled off. But it's higher if the people involved in the marriage are in, on their second or third marriage. And in those cases, it can be as high as 75 or 80% rate of divorce. About one third of all adults who are living and who have ever been married have experienced a divorce. The percentage is almost half for the baby boom generation. If you are, have a religious affiliation, do not have divorce in your family of origin, are older, have a higher income, more education, all those decrease the likelihood that you will be divorced. But the highest percentage of divorce occurs during the first three years of marriage. Cohabitation or couples living together has increased about 1,200% in the last 40 years. Some statistics say that 50% of couples are living together when they get married. I've heard as high as 90 to 95%. In my experience, I can think of only a handful of couples that were not living together before they got married in the marriage preparation programs that I was running. Almost 40% of cohabiting couples have children. And one of the things about cohabiting couples is that the rate of divorce for, for couples who live together before they get married is significantly higher. Although if they've, the choice to marry has already been made before you, start, before you begin to live together, that diminishes the rate of divorce. Despite all this seeming bad news, there are signs of hope. One encouraging statistic is that roughly two-thirds of both married men and married women would rate their marriages are, uh, as very happy. And that rate has remained fairly steady over the last 30 years when uh, researchers have counted those statistics. But in the last decade or so, we've experienced the growth of a marriage movement here in the United States that has very broad support in many sectors of society. The educational, therapeutic, religious, legal, and government. In many different ways, these agents are working together to acknowledge that the important role that marriage plays in our society in protecting children, transmitting values, and strengthening bonds between people and generations. There's been 
a new emphasis on learning the skills necessary to stay in marriage rather than going to some kind of counseling that will say that just because you don't feel like it anymore, you don't need to be married. One of the more influential coalitions is the Smart Marriages Coalition, which is a loose group of marriage and family therapists, uh, pastoral ministers of all denominations, and people who are interested in supporting mar and strengthening marriage from all areas, including, you know, there is everything from people who are teaching skills to avoid divorce, to uh, troubled marriages, to parenting skills uh, for step families, all sorts of things. But they, they have an annual conference um, and probably several thousand people come and they have a, an email list of about 10 or 15,000, I think. Another recent development has been the federal government's Healthy Marriage Initiative, in which grants were given to various nonprofit agencies and local groups to help couples form and sustain healthy marriages, and also to, uh, to target fatherhood and to say that there needs to be, in some populations, the skills to become a good parent needs to be taught. Portland, Maine has had a very successful community marriage initiative that brought together uh, members of the Catholic Church, Protestant congregations, Catholic charities, and other organizations, social organizations to support marriage within the community and to really give people the skills necessary to help support their marriages. So this is the backdrop for the Bishop's Pastoral Initiative on Marriage. In November of 2004, the bishops voted overwhelmingly to make marriage a top priority. So they launched, launched the National Pastoral Initiative, which is a multi-year effort to communicate the meaning and value of married life in the church and for society. And one of the interesting things about the initiative is that it brought together not just Catholic teaching and pastoral practice, but the best of social science research and the experience of married couples and pastoral ministers. The pastoral initiative began in early 2005 and is scheduled to run through 2011. <laughs> the initiative finished the first phase, which is research and consultation phase. Uh, many focus groups, I think over 200 focus groups were run across the country in dioceses and parishes. And looking at the experience of married couples, young adults who were, had never been married, um, all ages, couples who were had experienced divorce, and just to really get a state a sense of what married couples thought about marriage. There were also symposia and colloquia on canon law, sacramental theology, and various other topics. The current phase of the initiative includes the preparation of a bishop's pastoral letter, which should be brought to a vote at the November 2009 bishops' meeting. The National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers is devoting their entire annual conference in June to the pastoral initiative with the theme, Becoming a Marriage Building Church. And the final phase after the letter hopefully is issued in November will be the develop, further development of pastoral resources in support of marriage. As part of the National Pastoral Initiative, uh, the Church in the 21st Century Center brought together theologians and pastoral ministers in the area of marriage and family ministry in September of 2007. And this was a collaborative effort between C21 NACFLM, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the Center for Ministry Development, and the U.S. Bishops Conference. And those invited to present papers represented the diverse pastoral challenges we felt needed to be addressed going forward. Tim and I co-edited the volume of symposium papers, which hopefully will be published in the near future as part of the C21 series. At the symposium, we looked at the wedding liturgy itself as a means of formation, practical issues in parish weddings, such as the costs, the bridal industry itself, and what does it say when the first question you're asked when you call the parish to be married is, are you a parishioner? 
not welcome, we're really happy you, call, you called us and want to get married in our parish. We looked at the spe specific situations in the African American, Hispanic, and Asian American communities and what they can teach us about hospitality, inclusion, and a missionary stance toward evangelization. We learned that we needed to be more culturally sensitive and proficient in talking about marriage ministry. We discussed young adults, sacramental outreach at significant moments in the life cycle, such as baptismal prep, and we spoke of specific issues facing interchurch and interfaith families and couples, as well as the stresses of everyday life in middle class couples who are pressured by time and other commitments. And with a large number of blended families, how does the definition of family stretch and adapt to this changing reality? What about the adoption of children? And we often hear about being open to children in marriage, but for a quarter or a third or more of all couples who experience infertility, this becomes a very painful message to hear. And what about older couples who are long past the age of childbearing who decide to get married and share their life together? So if we're called into ever greater communion, how do we avoid the isolation that can sometimes afflict us in our contemporary lives? Many of us no longer live in a contained geographical area, and for those of us who live far from our family of origin or move frequently, we also need to cultivate what I call the family of the heart, not just the family of the blood. We need to speak of marital experience in terms of human relationships rather than abstract and ideal principles. Because most people find a complete disconnect between the often lofty language used in church to describe marriage in theological terms. So how do we describe marriage as a sacramental vocation, a process through the journey of life? And can we look at marriage as a unique spiritual discipline in Rick Gillardi's words, a daring promise. We think of the couple itself becoming a symbol of God's abiding presence in the world and how discipleship is essential to sacramental marriage. There's an ecclesial dimension to all this. The vocational call of married couples comes out of our baptism. And the married couple becomes a role model and a witness for all of us, despite and perhaps because of all the difficulties and joys they may encounter along the way. Change is the one essential dynamic in marriage. One practitioner has spoken about building multiple marriages over the course of a lifetime with the same partner. Renegotiating and restructuring throughout your marriage and the course of your life cycle requires memory. The care of persons, the creative love that begins with the life of the couple and may include children and other loved ones. The friendship and social dimension and the radical reconciliation and forgiveness that are necessary. In the current issue of C21 Resources on Spirituality, a number of the articles are on traditional spiritual practices. I suggest that most, if not all, of these are and can be practices of marital spirituality. Intercessory prayer is prayer for others. Of course, a married couple will be praying for each other, even if they don't use the words. The Ignatian Examen, a review of the day in Thanksgiving and the positive and negative feelings. What married person hasn't experienced that? And then looking forward to the next day with all it might bring. The prayerful path of a labyrinth. This could be a physical walk with my husband or a visualization of the twists and turns and perhaps some of the seeming dead ends that we've experienced on our life journey together the liturgy of the hours, the different times of day that I pray for my husband, my family, and the world. 
upon awakening and going to bed. Those daily rituals sometimes become a litany of prayer. The practice of hospitality. How are our homes and our hearts open and welcoming to all? And how do we continue to share our table with others? Retreat. Those are the moments that we can step away from our everyday routine to renew our relationship and to connect with the essence of who we are, separately and together. The communion of saints. Acts of remembrances for loved ones, particularly our personal models of faith. In Elizabeth Johnson's words, our cloud of witnesses, those who support us in our vocation of marriage. Direction. I think married couples are, their, are each other's spiritual directors. My husband is the always present companion in my life's journey and offers love, wisdom, and encouragement. But this also comes from other wise people I encounter. <laughs> the practice of discernment. Particularly in this time of economic hardship, the choices we make in our married lives have a moral and spiritual component. Are we mindful of God's presence, particularly in the care and stewardship of God's creation? Forgiveness. What married couple does not know the necessity and value of forgiving and being forgiven? It's certainly one of the essentials of marriage. At its heart, I believe a spiritual, spirituality of marriage is a spirituality of presence. Being physically, emotionally, and spiritually available to my spouse and to God. And it is living the incarnation in all its mystery and embodiment in everyday life. Thank you. Um, good evening. And uh, there's an old saying, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. <clears throat> in my many years in campus ministry, I used to always comment at staff meetings, <clears throat> I don't know why we do marriage preparation program. It belongs with the Alumni Association. <laughs> So four years ago when I slid over to the Alumni Association, our director said, oh, by the way, uh, we invite you to take the program with you and you can work on it. <laughs> so, um, and it's been a real blessing. And I, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Carol Quintiliani, who is here with her husband, Carmen. Carol, will you just wave, please? Carol and I um, co-facilitate the program and uh, some of you know her, she's terrific. So what I thought I would do is just to share, and I think Cynthia sent a wonderful context and, and gave us a really um, informative, solid backdrop for a lot of the anecdotal evidence uh, that we that we uh, have realized from working with the program now for uh, over four years. So I wanted to just share some of the uh, thoughts that uh, have occurred to us as to how people end up uh, contacting us or why they contact us to be part of these programs, what their expectations might be when they get there, um, maybe a little bit about the experience as we get feedback from them, and then some of the, the big ideas that we try to share with them. The program is based on married couples sharing um, stories from their lives around a certain theme. It's a very common way to do marriage preparation. So some of the big ideas that come, uh, that are offered for people's consideration around spirituality and around marriage in general, and then a few specific practices, and some of them I'm sure will overlap. Uh, they won't sound uh, quite as, as good as Cynthia said them, but uh, that's that's okay. When we get a call, or most likely an email, somebody will, will say, um, you know, uh, I'm recently engaged and uh, I'm an alum, or our program is open to uh, parishioners from St. Ignatius Parish as well. We have an agreement with them. So the first thing we do is we say congratulations, and uh, we're delighted. And as we converse with them, either on the phone or through email, the reactions range from either sheer excitement and this is what I've always wanted, and I'm very excited, and I want to plan this well, and the spirituality is very important to me, to sheer dread, and, and everything in between. Um, and even couples where, you know, one, one, one uh, 
uh, betrothed is the word. We, we don't use that often. We'll really be into it, and the other one's sort of just along for the ride like we go into the movies. <laughs> Something um, we have to do. It's a mandatory program, which is a curse and a blessing. So um, we, try to, we try to use that leverage and say, we hope, we really do say, we hope this weekend is not going to be terrible for you. We hope that you might leave with one idea that might be, become for you an important insight or idea that could really be helpful to you in your marriage somewhere down the line. So, um, and, and people do come with varied experiences, and I do think it's an, ecclesi an ecclesiological issue. Um, so much depends on people's experiences with their faith, with their parish, with a priest, who for many people, their parish priest is the church universal, for good or for bad. And so with, with myriad experiences, positive and negative, um, they show up on a Saturday morning. Some look glad to be there, others look like uh, they'd rather have knitting, knitting needles stuck in their eyeballs. <laughs> and we also hear, you know, can you find a priest for us? We don't know any priest. Uh, are you connected with a parish? No, we don't, we don't have any connection with a faith community or parish. Well, why do you want to get married in the church, in the Catholic Church? Well, my mother would kill me if we didn't. Um, or, it's very important to me, but I don't know why. So there's all kinds of reasons of, of how folks come to me. But I think deep down, many of the folks, it's important to me. I can't articulate it. I don't have the language. I haven't had the experiences. But I know deep down inside, it is important to me. Um, and they sort of trust us for that weekend. And as my, my, my predecessor said, for so many, it can be a very positive brush up. It, it has the potential to be a very positive brush up against the Catholic Church, which, as we all know, has sometimes good and, and not so good publicity around the idea, around the, um, uh, the realities of sexuality, relationships, and all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, and, and again, what, uh, what are their expectations? In fact, the, the program starts with a roundtable discussion from the engaged, uh, from the married couples, excuse me, on expectations. And we share what our expectations were. Generally, we have couples who've been married one, two, three years, all the way up to 45 years. And then we have subsequent talks on adjustment, communication, financial partnership, values, spirituality, and sexuality. 90% of the important work that's done is when after having a couple share their story around a particular theme in a real way, the ups and the downs, the good, the bad, and the ugly, there's nothing worse in a marriage preparation program than a perfect talk from a, fir a perfect couple. Uh, we had a couple like that, and the uh, evaluations were awful. Nobody could relate to them. You know, I don't even want to say much more because I'm afraid I'd give it away. But <laughs> so, um, so the real work is after a couple gives a talk, the married couple, the engaged couple goes off for 20 minutes, and they each have a little worksheet to do, thoughts around the topic provocative questions, and they talk together. They share a conversation. The idea of the program is to make sure that certain things get talked about, or conversations are begun or are furthered, and they're all over the place. Some are talking about financial partnership for the first time, and others have had this conversation a thousand times. Some are talking about sexuality, and what does it mean to be sexual in a relationship, in a marriage, for the first time. Um, so it's very interesting. Some of the um, um, some of the, the spiritual practices which emerge, uh, and Tim um, asked us to speak on this question, asked me to speak on this question, and I like the way that's phrased. The spiritual practices that might emerge, which would be helpful in addressing their hopes and their concerns and their anxieties. But what we try to do is we don't preach at people. We think we have a good program that's really grounded in good Catholic theology. But it comes across through a witness talk where a couple is speaking in I, in our relationships. This is what's important to us. This is what we have found. Here's where we got into a little bit of a, a problem. Here's how we resolved it. Here's why we think important, uh, forgiveness is important. So it's not being preached at. But a couple of big ideas that generally uh, we encourage our couples to put out there, you know, in a genuine way for their consideration. I'll just mention a couple of big ideas and then a couple of spiritual practices. One is is, first of all, generally speaking, it's a Catholic Christian group, but there are, it can be up to 50% of mixed religious groups, so Catholics, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, um, and we welcome all kinds of people. We really, um, really try to make it a very, very welcoming and respectful environment in all that we do from the first call, from the first contact all the way through the program. 
But one, one concept is we, we try to share that any healthy, vibrant, life-giving spirituality is one that is fully integrated into everyone's, into their whole life, in every dimension of their personal life and of their shared life as a married couple. Uh, we all know about compartmentalization, and I've been guilty of it myself uh, often, where my faith and the practice of my faith is sort of pushed off to the side, and there are different sides of me. A healthy spirituality tries to integrate that into uh, an authentic, genuine personhood, humanness. Uh, um, and all the talks will talk about that. All the talks will mention that. Values, financial partnership, how one saves money, spends money, uh, based on priorities, based on an appreciation for what one has, a, a, a appreciation uh, and gratitude towards God for what one has, and how that will affect financial decisions. Communication, you name it, right down the line. Secondly, the idea, and I do agree with Cynthia, that um, there's nothing worse than a big abstract concept, but in my experience, I don't even hear a lot of these concept being, concepts being talked about. Um, the idea that a marriage is a vocation, is a legitimate vocation on par with any other vocation in the church. I've come to see personally, I don't see vocation as um, vertical or you know from the top down. I don't think that Father So-and-So's vocation is any more important than mine as a married person. I see voc I've come to see vocation, my opinion, as horizontal. They're all equally important. They all have a vital role to play in our faith community. Um, and I, I mention that because in my own battle, and I, I, I'll say struggle battle, when I graduate, I went to BC, class of 82. I'm glad to see so many students here. Do you have to come for a class? Is this extra credit? <laughs> Professor Maltoon make you come? No, okay, good. I invited them. Okay, yeah, with the red pen out, right? I'll see you there. I felt and still do feel called to priesthood. Um, but to make a very long story very short, I was in love with a woman, and um, so I had this on-again, off-again kind of relationship and this, this constant battle of, I really feel God calling me to serve as an ordained priest in the Catholic Church, and yet I feel so, um, I feel like I'm moving towards completeness and wholeness in this relationship. So I did what most guys do, I avoided it. When I graduated, I did JVI for a year and a half, and, and we broke up. So out of sight, out of mind. Well, well, it doesn't really work that way. So I sort of wrestled with that. I uh, had a very good experience with JVI in Latin America in the early 80s. But when I came home, and Joyce and I didn't write, didn't talk, didn't call, didn't communicate for a year and a half. The day I got home, I called her. First miracle was she was still available. <laughs> Second miracle was she wanted to see me. So we started to go out again. Um, the step right before there, and again in this wrestling, was that I was told by a priest, before I felt free enough to contact her, I was told by a priest, if you want to live your vocation fully, if you want to be a Christian in the fullest, most proper sense, be a priest. Everything else is weakness. Everything else is second best. Uh, and I came to see that as BS. Uh, it was a struggle. I had some other advice. But I had never heard of the theology of marriage. I had never heard of the vocation of marriage, as, as Cynthia described it so beautifully, a witness to the world. So we suggest that, and it's amazing how many folks in our program have never thought about that because they've never heard of it. It hasn't been part of their faith upbringing or part of their parish agenda. So I'm delighted to hear so many um, movements on that front. And the other thought, too, one more thought, uh, which has two implications. The idea that for Catholic Christians, that the heart of our faith is a personal relationship with the living, risen Christ, a personal relationship lived out in the context of community. For so many Catholics, and the ones before us in those programs, their faith, their Catholic faith, is sort of an ascent to a body of ideas. I'm Catholic because I agree with the creed. That's wonderful, the creed is very important. But what about the heart of that relationship with God through Christ for Catholic Christians? That is the foundation of everything. And how one nurtures that in prayer, personally, not privately, but personally, uh, with one's spouse, uh, betrothed, and in the context of a wider community. And for some folks, it's a new idea. It's amazing to me. Not, it's not amazing because it was a new idea, for, new idea for me at one time. But it's an amazing new idea. And to see some of the lights go, go on, I've never thought about that. The idea that the unit together now, this husband and wife, and eventually, possibly, with or without children, uh, is a domestic church. You know, the church of the home. That there are 
uh, responsibilities and their joys and there's a way to practice and, and worship together at home in addition is also kind of a new idea. And then the last real big idea, and then a few quick things here. Um, the importance of connecting with a faith community that really matters, a community of like-minded, like-hearted folks who can help them, affirm them, challenge them, help them to grow. Uh, we hear from students so often that it's easy to be in a meaningful faith community at BC. But when they leave, I'd say more than half really feel sort of distressed and distraught that they haven't found that same kind of faith community that really matters, keeps them grounded, gives their life meaning. So the importance of finding that uh, big idea. See. And then very quickly, some of these have been mentioned, the importance of prayer. Uh, my personal prayer life, but also my prayer life with my wife and with my family. My wife's a very different person. Um, um, she's busy tonight at work, but it's never been really her thing to kind of uh, go on retreats and do service work because she was working her rear end off to put herself through school. She's not real comfortable with shared prayer. We have two very different styles, but we try to make it work and compromise in a way that it's prayerful, but in a way that's connecting us together with God um, in a way that's non-threatening um, and to make time for that um, even, even with our kids now we had three sweet loving beautiful kids until they hit adolescence and then we don't know what happened um, one's becoming a human being again the woman the, my daughter who's here she's a nice person my 17 year old son and I always say this have you seen Napoleon Dynamite <laughs> that's him <laughs> So, but he's coming around, then our little one, you know, now her head spins around, so. <laughs> but at least we say grace. I know, I know, I know, no names. But at least, you know, but we pray together before dinner, and we, we call that um, practicing gratitude, to take some time to be grateful to God for what we have, even if it's that. Some kind of regular worship. We're probably good about three weekends out of four going to Mass together, and we, we consider that an accomplishment to get teenagers to Mass. Um, and then service. We've begun to serve at a shelter. Some kind of practice of loving neighbor, some kind of practice, practicing selflessness, something that gets us out of ourself, um, and for, for many reasons, as you can imagine, uh, to do and to love others. And then finally, one of my favorite quotes is um, attributed to Francis of Assisi, uh, preach the gospel always, use words if necessary. So the kind of spirituality that can be practiced at every moment of every day the practice of love in the home, and as Cynthia said, forgiveness, understanding, making time, listening, caring, and receiving, and also practice, giving that love as well. That to me is one of the most genuine spiritualities that, that any couple, any family can have. Final thought, a good friend of mine who's a Jesuit on campus often says to me, I say to, to couples, and I say to people, if you really want to know what God's all about, go talk to a married couple. Uh, ohala, if that was really true, and I think it can be, maybe more so than we, than we know. So thank you. Thank you. How to follow up on that. That's all very good. Um, some really fine insights. Um, I want to observe a couple of uh, points that, that Cindy and Dan have raised. Um, and, and I'm going to do this um, for all of about a minute because this is about as technical as I, I get. My students will recognize this. Um, the rest of you won't. Um, Aristotle described uh, that the development of a person's character takes place through a very careful weighing of um, different ideals and there's a and what emerges is a certain practice in living and to me uh, marriage is is certainly one form of the spiritual life which like any form of the spiritual life means that there are practices that that you know have to be part of it and this image that sticks with me uh, I think it's a wonderful image it's uh, it's the image of a sheepdog I was uh, using this, um, this text on Aristotle that used this image, I think it's right on. The sheepdog runs all the time, and, and if it gets too close to the sheep, it scares them away, they get all skittish. And if it, if it backs away too far, then the sheep will just wander off and get lost and get themselves into trouble. So this, this author was suggesting that the development of a person's character is like this, following Aristotle, that there's this balance between proximity and distance, or between action and 
you know, call it sort of attentiveness, but not activity. So the idea here is that, and, and for me, the spiritual life of, of marriage is fundamentally about finding that balance of you know, asking myself, you know, when am I being properly attentive and when am I doing and then when am I being receptive, when am I receiving the gifts that, that Sue has to give me. So I, just, I love that image as a way of sort of um, thinking about not only the spiritual life but, but, um, but marriage in general. Um, marriage for me um, is a specific uh, context of thinking about every human being's vocation, which is to learn how to love. And, and of course, in a particularly intimate way in, in the context of marriage. Michael Himes, um, who's in our theology department here at Boston College, has written about love being the least wrong way to speak about God. And, and I think about that very compellingly, that, that, that marriage becomes the very school within which I practice what it means to love and thereby to essentially learn what it means to be a human being. Because Lord knows if I did it by myself, then I'd just be flying off into intellectual you know, fancies on a regular basis. So she keeps me grounded. So thank you for that. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also really excited to see so many students here, particularly because Tim and I went to BC and the stage where you are now is the stage where I personally was forming my vision of what I wanted in a marriage and who I wanted to, to be as a spouse and the kind of spouse I was looking for. Even thinking about you know being a freshman and looking at St. Ignatius and thinking, I wonder if I'll find my husband here. I wonder if I'll get married there. Um, you know, what what's going to happen with that? And you know, dated people that did not end up being my spouse while I was here. And I actually ended up marrying Tim or dating Tim after we graduated, but we were here together as students. And during that time that I was a student, one of my good friends gave me a little book that um, still kicking around. We were going to bring it, except it got lost in the confusion of soccer and Chinese and all of that with little kids. But the quote that was in this book struck me at the time that that was what I wanted in a marriage. And it was, love consists not in two people looking at each other, but rather in two people looking together in the same direction. And the book wasn't about marriage, it was about friendship. But that, that, that really struck me that that would be the foundation for the kind of marriage that could be a vocation and, and weather storms. And I found that that is true in the, in the 16 years I've had of living out my vocation being married to Tim, that the fact that we're not just looking at each other, you, that you're looking together at a journey to, in life and down a road together, not just saying, well, okay, he's got his flaws and he's got his attributes. I've got my flaws and I've got my attributes. What am I going to focus on? Is this going to be enough for me? All those things are true and they're still part of the daily life of living together, but saying we're doing something together. And, and as Catholic Christians, we have so much that's part of the, the tradition of our church and the teaching of our church that helps us to see yeah, that that is what you're doing. And the things that we'll be talking about tonight aren't unique to those who are Catholics or those who are Christians, but I think we have a certain richness upon which to draw because it's a sacrament where we have grace that's given to us and that sense that it's a vocation, that we're not just about who am I for him and who is he for me, but who, what are we doing together? What are we doing together as parents of our children? What are we doing together for the community of our church, just for the community we live in, um, and as, as people outside of ourselves? And that ends up, I think, being something that can help you through those times where marriage isn't necessarily just the romantic, the glamorous, the things you're looking for when you say that would be an interesting person to date or that would be someone I would be attracted to or to whom I'd be attracted. Um, The, uh, the the language that both Cindy and Dan were referring to, of course, was was vocation, and, and Sue's mentioned it also. Um, I, I teach a course here on Ignatian spirituality, and so much of the way that I tend to approach these questions is through the lens of Ignatius of Loyola and his and his spirituality. 
And in particular, when I was thinking about this, this talk, what, what emerged as um, central here as much as anywhere else when talking about the spiritual life is that fundamentally it's about responding to a God who's already trying to get our attention, you know, so who is already in some way trying to uh, share with us the reason why we're here in the first place. So Ignatius's language um, in, in a little uh, pithy section of his book, The Spiritual Exercises, called The First Principle and Foundation, he just describes, look, God put us here for something, and we ought to desire what it is that we're here for. So when I think about, you know, the way that Dan was describing, you know, his own process of coming to recognize, aha, Joyce is the one. I mean, there's, there's something about a realization that goes on here. This fits, this fits who I am, that, that this isn't foreign, you know, that this is being imposed on me, but in a sense that this person is able to elicit from me things that would never be elicited except because of this person. You know, so, so there's something deeply, I think, just remarkable about that. So you know, even in light of the statistics that Cindy was observing a few minutes ago, uh, you know, I, I tend to be an idealist, I suppose, but, but I'm left with, with this observation. Glass half full, glass half empty. Okay, half of marriages don't survive. But, but part of me wants to say, half of marriages last people's entire lives. Man, that's, that's extraordinary. That is truly extraordinary. We think we forget that. So there's real holy ground here. I mean, that, that if I find in the other person something, again, that elicits from me something that I wouldn't otherwise recognize, that's, that's, remarkable, um, that's a remarkable thing. So immediately when thinking about practices, the question becomes, well, all right, what are the practices then that emerge from this person who I am created to be in relationship with her? So Aristotle talks about this idea that, that we're always striving for some end, you know. And, you know, within the context of the spiritual life, ultimately our end is God. But even in a, in a more kind of, um, I, I suppose, pedestrian way of looking at it, everybody's striving for a measure of happiness. And that when I think about learning that way of, you know, discovering happiness with this other person, then a lot of the sort of contours of the spiritual life of marriage become much more clear because it's no longer about me, it's about, it's about us, it's about this, this, um, this relationship. You know, Tim's the theologian who quotes Aristotle, and I'm the counselor, so I tend to be focused on the relational part of it. And yeah. when I was thinking about this, one of the images that struck me was a, a conference I went to uh, a couple years ago. A great counselor who's developed an approach to working with couples in midlife on helping them to rescue marriages from the brink and, and renew their marriages. Um, and he has a center in Cambridge. And he was talking about the vulnerability that modern marriages have, particularly at midlife, because of our changing expectations of marriage. Particularly women have changed their expectations of what marriage should give them. It should not just be that we're married and we raise the kids and we just stay married because we've been married. But you've got a lot of life left. You've got a lot of things that you want out of um, your the time you have and you want someone who's an emotional partner, who's a, a spiritual partner, who um, is fun to be with, who's sexy, who's, you know, all those things. And all of a sudden some of these expectations get placed on marriage and maybe both per people in that marriage have not um, agreed to that same thing. That's, okay, we're married, we should just stay married. And so that when this pressure of what do we want from marriage gets changed, sometimes the marriages don't stay together because they're not able to flex with that. And that brought me back to the quote I thought I was mentioning earlier, thinking if we're trying to say, I want you to be all of these things for me, and I have to be all these things for you, Sometimes that becomes too much pressure to say, how can that other person be all of those things? And, you know, as Christians, we want marriage to provide us with happiness, fulfillment, romance, all those things that anyone would want from a marriage. And I'm not saying that we put all those things aside. But spiritual practice in marriage says, I'm not just looking to you to fulfill that. I'm looking to 
our, my, my relationship with God, my relationship with those who are part of our cloud of witnesses. And I see you not just as the source of my personal fulfillment, are you all the things that I need, but also as the person I, to whom I should be serving and giving. And hopefully, in a good marriage, that's going to lead to reciprocity. And this approach to counseling even says that what you do is you kind of leverage that. And you get that person to say, if you want this marriage to work, the way you make it work is you start giving. And the more you give, the more you're going to get back. Not in an unhealthy, unbalanced way, but that there was no sense of spirituality in terms of a religion in this. But it brought in these great spiritual principles that I think we have at our disposal as Christians, that when you serve, and you see that person's happiness as your goal, then, then that's going to bring the happiness, the fulfillment, and that sense of, of being able to be in a solid partnership. Not because that person is, is just in themselves your soulmate and makes you happy, but because you choose to give to each other. So in, in light of this observation, I want to suggest that, that one practice that emerges as, I, I think, obvious in the context of any good marriage is, uh, and we can call it by many names, but some practice of reflection. All right, now here's the sort of generic version of it. Um, end of the day, hey, what was your day like? Oh, you know, this happened at work, I talked to so-and-so, you know, this was a real bummer, I'm looking forward to this. You know, so there's a natural sort of inbuilt process of reflection, I think, just in conversation. And, and, and again, this was a, a theme that, that Dan reflected on, I think, very, very well. Um, conversation, etymologically means turning together. There's a great priority on holy conversation in many spiritual traditions, including the Ignatian tradition, but the idea that it is within the process of conversation that two human beings do this kind of turning. And again, that image that, that Sue referred to early, earlier, it's, it's not the two looking at each other, it's that we're turning towards a greater understanding of reality. Ultimately, the reality of me, the reality of you, the reality of us, the reality of God, the reality of the world. So, so holy conversation emerges as a practice. In uh, the Ignatian tradition, um, the examine, the examine of consciousness becomes a specific practice. Where did I find God present in my day to day? And where do I find God present in my marriage? You know, in the way that she just touched me ever so lightly on my wrist, you know, as I went out the door in the morning. Or the way that, you know, my spouse, um, you know, has this regular practice of making coffee in the morning. Whatever it is, you know, whatever act of kindness. Um, the, the bishops, as part of their uh, their pastoral initiative on marriage have put together these very interesting um, TV ads, essentially. They're, they're public service announcements. And the, the, the question throughout is, what have you done for your marriage today? And they, you know, pick people on the street, what have you done for your marriage today? And the, you know, the one guy says, well, I took out the trash this morning without being asked. And then she says, oh, well, I rubbed his shoulders before he went to work. And then he says, oh, well, then I did this and that. You know, so all of these practices are just ways of bringing an attentiveness to just everyday life, you know, so there's no magic formula here, it's just that, that it's done with a certain measure of attentiveness, and again, it's a very Ignatian theme, but, um, but the other thing that it does is it makes, I think over the long haul, it makes both people aware that there is no golden road that allows every day to be happy. You know, there's going to be movements of consolation and desolation, that's the Ignatian language. There are going to be movements, parts of life where things are, are sailing along, and there are other parts of life where they're really Really slogging, you know, and and to see each other not as antagonists in that process, but fellow pilgrims in that process. Oh yeah, today it's a little bit tough for us, you know, but we're going to get through it. You know, I, I think bringing a sense of spirituality to a marriage is indispensable um, at least, and I think it's more, but at least in the sense that it gets you to see the bigger picture and not just the what's in front of my eyes right now. So, uh, so both of those things emerge as, as you know, important practices as well. And with this image of marriage as a shared pilgrimage, this necessarily going to include the principles of forgiveness and self-sacrifice. And these aren't necessarily the kind of romantic and sexy images that we like to have when we think about marriage early on, but they're not burdensome. 
they are really the core of how we end up making each other happy. You know, you think, oh, I'm married and that person makes me happy. They don't just in themselves make me happy. He makes me happy by making me happy, by choosing to do those things that make me happy, whether that's the little things, whether that's just you know being attentive, being patient, being forgiving, being tolerant. Um, and a lot of times that involves self-sacrifice. And so that is a core spiritual practice. When I cho- choose to hold my tongue or you know decide to not say something that I kind of would, you know, I'm, I'm the one that's more quick to, to spout off and say something. Um, and when we choose to say, I forgive you, and make that a principle in our in our conversations and in the way that we teach our children, that forgiving each other is a, a very deliberate example that we set in our family life, that's a spiritual practice. That's something that I feel like we've we've gotten because of taking a Christian mindset into what we're doing in this work of being married. So, um, speaking more about practices, spiritual practices, I I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that anything in the context of married life can be conceived of as a a spiritual practice, if, in fact, it is... um, Oriented toward the end of you know this this larger purpose that we have as a couple, um, and, and I'll even mention um, a, a couple in this context. Uh, Dan again was was I think very very strong on on talking about marriage as you know being of equal dignity as as other vocations in the church, and that language is much more common today. But it was not common at you know at one time in the church's history. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I was looking at a, a little cartoon. It was in the old Baltimore Catechism that Catholics of a certain vintage will will remember. And uh, the the picture, uh, it's actually a, a series of pairs of pictures. And the caption beneath one is, this is good, and the caption beneath the other is, this is better. So you probably know what I'm talking about. So the picture, uh, this is good, is um, a couple you know, getting married. I want to choose my spouse. And then the other picture is the priest saying, uh, I choose Christ as my spouse. You know, so that's good, but choosing Christ as your spouse is better. You know? So th- there was this you know, sense of juxtaposing. You know, ordinary people, all right, they get married. But you know, if you're really holy, then by all means, you know, enter the convent or or, you know, become a priest. Um, again, the language today is, is, is much more along the lines of, you know, that, that God calls all people into some vocation in life, and, and that however we live it out is going to be our response to God. Um, but I think about this, you know, against the, the longer backdrop of the history of Christian spirituality, and there are uh, three areas that... Um, inevitably emerge as critical for the way that we live out of vocation. Uh, Now, some of you will recognize these terms, poverty, chastity, and obedience. They're the three vows that people entering religious life take, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And and in in class, I've sometimes talked about this, um, that they they focus the attention on three great challenges that that face anybody, namely uh, money, sex, and power. You know, how do you use those things? How do you choose to use the faculties and the talents that God has given you? Um, and how do you, you know, how do you orient them in some way that in the long run allows my life to bear witness to the God who created me? So, you know, how, how is it that within the context of marriage, we deal with money, sex, and power, all right? So, you know, the first one, money, you know, anybody who's married knows that that's a big deal. And, and Cindy might be able to correct me on this, but at least less Last time I checked, um, money is, I think, still the biggest thing that leads to real conflict with the marriage. I'm not far off on that, right? So, um, you know, so learning how to deal with money is is not an easy thing for any two people to do. You know, there's there's going to have to be negotiation there. But again, holy conversation allows that process to be part of this larger orientation of this vocation. Um, so poverty, chastity, um, this is less straightforward than I think we tend to imagine it is. Um, to me, in, in, in some ways, this is, this is a real key. The large question for me is, how do we choose to orient our desires? 
toward something that is good, something that is true, something that is beautiful. So it's not just, you know, okay, married people get to have sex and, you know, religious people don't. I, you know, that's just frighteningly simplistic. But um, it's, it's a way of asking, all right, look, if, if I love the entire person who is there, then look, there's a, there's a physical part there too, and how do I orient my own self towards the good of the marriage? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a complex, complex question, but a very, very good question, I think. And the last one, um, you know, with obedience, it, it's actually, you know, part of the language of the marriage liturgy, you know, obeying, or at least it, it, of a certain vintage. Um, you know, will you obey the other? And of course, I understand that you know there's there's a long history of critique of um, you know the, the models of marriage that that have sort of flowed into the Western tradition. I understand that, but on a very real level, the pledge to obey the other, you know, my pledge to obey her and her pledge to obey me, you know, I see that as part and parcel of this larger theme of of holy conversation of turning toward not just my good, not just your good, but our good. There's a conversion process in that, and it involves obedience. So practically speaking, um, I would never make a big decision without her. I, I just simply would. It's an unfathomable to me. Um, the process of shared discernment, you know, how do we make decisions together? That's part of holy obedience in the context of marriage. So, so I think, you know, in, in different ways, but parallel ways, these, these vows uh, make sense within the context of marriage just as well as within the context of religious life. It's been very interesting in our relationship to see how that shared discernment happens. You know, there are certain times where, you know, one of us is feeling drawn to something that might be uncomfortable or um, just uncertain. The other person's not feeling drawn in the same way. But we try to have a, a respect for what the Holy Spirit might be doing with that person and respect for the, just the other person enough to kind of be patient and listen and not just shut them down. Or at least hopefully in the bigger picture, it might get shut down first and then we have to reopen it. Um, but that's one of the advantages, I think, of starting to have a little, little bit more history behind us. We used to do marriage prep when we'd been married like two or three years, which just now seems very funny. We knew a lot then. Yeah, we did. A lot more than we do now, I guess. Um, but to have the, those times where we can look back and say, you know, I, I see that you know God was leading you, and I wasn't sure that that's what we should be doing. But now I can now I see. That, that that is what we should be doing together. Or that we started to be open to feeling that same certainty, that same drawing on our own hearts. Um, it's part of what Tim was writing about is our experience of, of how we formed our family um, in opening ourselves up to um, to international adoption and our, our daughters were born in China and you know that's one of those experiences of saying you know God's telling me something and he's saying I'm not hearing that and but then trusted enough me and also God's work in our life to be open to that and to hear that and to now be leading you know he, he was the one leading the charge for our second daughter things like that where I think that the gift that you have as a Christian in in practicing your faith in your marriage is it's not just am I right or are you right where are we on this Who, who's going to win this fight but okay we're not in the same place we might fight and then we go okay but how do we get beyond this and that that to me is just where I feel that sacrament working you know they said what you're doing today is a sacrament okay great you know that's great what does that mean well in time it's like you see that that sacrament works because you see how if you open yourself up to it God creates that unity by those experiences. And the times where there are, is disunity, that kind of becomes those broken places that if you work on it and you allow it, there's strength that comes from the healing of those wounds and those broken places. You know, no, no one is hopefully not the that perfect couple, which we probably sounded like when we were doing the thing two years afterwards. It was great. Um, and, and one of the things from our wedding liturgy that always struck me, it's, it's one of the only things I really remembered from the homily. Um, Father Mark Andrews, who's a Jesuit, who was a friend of Tim's who was here at the time, married us at St. Ignatius. And he said in his homily, you go into marriage expecting to make sacrifices and end up making sacrifices you never expected. And so many times in the hard places of our marriage, I'm like, wow. He was so right. I'm, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we know what sacrifices we're going to be making. And I didn't know all the sacrifices we were going to be making. 
But at the same time, I think, thank goodness he, you know, he said that, that he, he told us those things. Because then when you're in the middle of those times, you're like, this feels like a sacrifice. You know, I'm making decisions for his career that are disastrous for my career. <laughs> you know, he's doing things to put, you know, priority on allowing me to be home for my, you know, my children, things like that. And, and sometimes even in bigger, more personal things. But when you can say, this isn't about what am I losing in this deal? It's about, okay, I'm sacrificing, but I know that I'm getting that back because he's attentive to that. He's mindful of that. He's not just thinking what he's gaining. He's thinking, what is God doing for both of us? And how can I be more of a servant because of the, the things that the other is, is losing? So even though I'm, I was thinking about this, we're writing and talking about things like sacrifice and um, and giving things up and being... Um, putting yourself last, it, all, it doesn't sound appealing, but it is. And it says, yay, you know, I want to sign Sacrifice. on for that. Um, when you have a partnership in a marriage, or even if the one person approaches it in that way, in, in a, obviously in a, in a healthy relationship where you can say, I'm going to give because that's going to be my witness to the other, that that ends up drawing you into a relationship that becomes reciprocal. And, and I feel like God is really, really in that. Um, and one of the, the concrete practices that we were, were given from some older couples that we knew early in our marriage was something that called, they called a sit-down, which was as basic as creating time and space in your marriage to sit down and just talk about the state of the marriage. And, you know, where are you both? What are you getting out of it? What, you know, where are you feeling your needs are not being met? Where is God in this? Um, what are the goals that you want to set together? And... When we found when we first did it, it was like, well, we left it and we didn't feel like it was very romantic and that it wasn't really nice and we ended up talking about all the hard things that were going on. So we must be doing it wrong. And really then ended up getting this counsel that, no, that was, that was exactly what should be happening. It's not necessarily going to be a feel-good experience. This is before we had kids, so we kind of thought we'll have coffee or we'll have dinner and we'll relax and it'll be this nice time to sit down and talk about our marriage. And we'd end up talking about where we felt stuck. But what a time of grace that ends up being. Um, and then even the times where we go, wow, we've gone a really long time without doing that. Because it's a great practice, but you don't always remember to be doing that. And especially in the, the vulnerable times in life where you're easily distracted. But, but that's the kind of thing where a Christian marriage says it's not just about, you know, how are we now? Are we okay? But are we working on this? Are we planning on this? Are we making sure that we're allowing God into all the crevices in, in our lives? There's a, there's a reason. I'll, I'll, we'll end on this uh, point so that we have time for some questions. So if you've got them, um, you know, please have them ready. Um, there's a reason for me, uh, you know, I, I, I deal with this stuff from an ac academic perspective, but there's a reason for me why uh, marriage emerges as the key metaphor throughout the biblical texts to describe the relationship between God and people. It's a marriage, you know, so we find it in the Old Testament, we find it in the New Testament, you know, God as the, or, or Christ the bridegroom, uh, the church the bride. You know, the prophetic texts uh, talk about, you know, God as the lover and Israel as the beloved. You know, this, this image is a very strong one throughout scripture. And, you know, for me, the key here is that it's through the practice of intimacy that we learn something about, um, well, not only about life, but I think ultimately about what the, the whole, um, you know, orientation is of, of why we're here in the first place. Um, you know, marriage is, it's a crucible in many ways. And without making this sound, you know, too um, ponderous, um, you know, what I want to end on is the observation that there's something in human beings, and, and I deal with this in, in, in my classes a lot, you know, this theme of desire, that, that there's something in people that impels us to seek out relationships. It just it, it impels us to. And, and to take that very, very seriously, again, the scriptural testimony suggests that, to take that very, very seriously is to learn something about the way that God operates. Again, Michael Himes, love emerges as the least wrong way to speak about God. So for me, the syllogism is, if that's true, then marriage is the context within which we can most aptly learn about God because we're practicing 
the the difficulty of love. Now, and again, in the Christian tradition, of course, um, you know, with with the central image of the crucifixion, you know, this is the implication of you know what it means to love. You know, so so the idea of sacrifice is not the final answer. You know, the idea of sacrificing within marriage is not the final answer. Certainly, in my own experience, I don't sacrifice for the sake of sacrificing. I sacrifice for the sake of something that is in the in the long run a source of incredible joy. You know, and that's the bottom line. That that this is to me, um, you know, the, the the real secret. That I wonder why we haven't said more about this in our own tradition. It's there. I mean, it's there. But I but I think it sometimes it gets buried in some of the practical thing. So that said, um, I'll, I'll just close by observing that um, if. You know, what I started with, Aristotle is, is correct about the practices that make us who we are, then it's the practices of loving on a daily basis and in the long term that make um, the marriage a source of great joy. Thank you.